I want to start my presentation telling you a short story about a project that I did many years ago. The customer was um, a public administration that is in charge to uh, manage the citizens' voter states. Okay? One citizen could vote for the uh, municipal parties uh, depending on its actual state. The users of this application was divided in two kinds. There was a front-end user that just queried the database to extract information about the, the citizen status, about voting. And another kind of user, the back-end user, that um, used the application to change the voter state, the citizen state, sorry, uh, depending on some business logic uh, uh, about the electoral laws in Italy. The application, we start developing application, building a single uh, domain model, like we will do it with Rails. You develop your application, you create the citizen model, you define permission on that uh, application using, for example, device or CanCan, and, uh, and starting adding logic to the single citizen class. The project, even if it's still uh, in use uh, and it works uh, quite well, is in fact a failure from a point of view of the architecture. Because the citizen class became quickly uh, a big ball of mud filled with logic for, for a back-end user and from front-end user. Okay. So the problem is that we choose to um, define a single domain model for all the users. This seems good at the beginning, but quickly become unmanageable. Another point is that our domain model was something like this. I mean, all the objects of the application were, in, were interconnected. So from one object, we can reach each other. So we can start from the citizen, load its address. From the address of the citizen, we can load all the citizens that are in the same address. Or we can, from the citizen, we can go to the state of the citizen and load all the, um, all the other citizens that are in the same state. You can navigate the, the object tree, the object graph, using the relation, like we do in, with, with, like we do in race, using as many belongs to, and so on. And this was, which seems a good feature because, okay, with the graph is fully navigable, but it has many drawbacks. And it's the main reason that why our project failed from the architectural point of view. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Emanuele, I come from Italy. Um, I work in a small company as a software developer. Actually, I'm not a real Ruby developer. I'm a C-sharp developer. Sorry for that. And, but I work uh, in Ruby in my spare time, in my free time. And, um, this talk is a part of an experiment I did, porting um, a domain-driven architecture written in C-sharp to Ruby. Because uh, um, in C-sharp, writing this kind of architecture involved the need to write lots of architect infrastructural code to manage the, all the uh, abilities of this kind of architecture. And I thought that in Ruby, writing this kind of architecture was much simpler, and in fact, it is. So let's start thinking what, talking about what is domain-driven design is about. Domain-driven design is a technique um, invented by Eric Evans in 2004 with his book. And it's a sort, it's a many thing. It is a, a way to do analysis on big projects. I mean, we are developer team, we meet the domain experts, we talk with the domain experts to gather requirements. And in the book, it explains how analysis should be made to get the most useful information in our application. It's about design. The book is full of um, design principles to, to be applied, is architectural consideration on um, how to design our application. And finally, is a series of patterns to apply in our applications. This pattern starts with a consideration. Whenever you start developing a new, a new application, usually you meet the, the business expert, the domain expert, and talk with them about what they need. Okay? 
the first thing you should do in, the, in these meetings is to define the vocabulary. It is important that when you talk about contract, uh, invoice, user, customer, you and the customer agree on the meaning of this, of this word. Because sometimes they are different, okay? Sometimes it happens that for you, a user is the user of your application, but for the customer, a user has the different meaning, okay? So in the book, Eric Havens talks about ubiquitous language. So the first thing you should do is to define the ubiquitous language that you and your customer and everybody that will use the application should use to, to talk during the meeting. And this ubiquitous language goes straight in the code. That means that if the customer calls a things a contract, you will have the contract class, maybe, in your code. And the name should be the same, okay? This is one of the first point, one of the basic point. Another thing that you, we, should, we should consider with developing application is the point of view of the, uh, of the customer on some of this object. Often, in a company, there are different offices that work in different areas of the business of the company. And the contract in one office could have different meaning of the contract in another office because they use contract in different way, okay? So it is important to define the context, the bounded context, in which we have to divide our application to describe which operation should be used, should be done in a, in a, on a certain object or what in other object. In, in my story at the beginning, the problem was that we didn't define the context of the application because the front-end user has a completely different context from the back-end user. So they use the same citizen object, but they use the citizen object in a completely different way. And we didn't care about, we didn't manage this at the beginning, so we had a lot, we had a lot of problems on this. So for example, in a classical Release application, we, when we have a customer model, we create just one customer object, one customer class we define, with all the attributes needed to manage the customer. Actually, if we consider the context, we should split the class in two different classes and put the, uh, the appropriate attributes and, and actions on the right class. So for example, the, on, the, uh, on your left side, the customer is as the shipping address and the method ship order. Because maybe this class, this class is used, to the delivery for, uh, used by the delivery office to deliver uh, goods to the customer. The other side, we have the same customer, another customer class, sorry, but has different attributes and different methods. Because maybe this class is used by the invoicing office to, to send invoice to customer. So the customer is the same, but the models inside our application should be different. Another distinction that uh, uh, Eric Evans does in, in this book is to define two kind of object. Object that has an ID, an identity, that are called entities, and object that have not a real entity, a real identity, that are just value. For example, in the case of customer, customer is an entity because it is an ID, an identification. It could be an ID number or whatever you want. Address, instead, doesn't have a real ID because two address, if they are the same attribute, are the same, okay? So it's important in our application to split, to, uh, to decide which, are, which objects are, ent are entities and which are values. Another point that uh, uh, he, um, Evans insisted on is the definition of aggregate. Our domain model should not be all interconnected, but should be div divided in areas, in aggregates, he called. Every aggregate has um, uh, an aggregate root, that is the class on the top, and every aggregate should guarantee the consistencies of itself. Okay, that means that the blue aggregate should, should guarantee the consistencies of itself inside. So all the operation that you can do on an aggregate 
should be done using the aggregate root. You cannot access the inside the object in, under the aggregate root. Okay. And every aggregate should be separated from other. We don't have a relation. We don't have a point of contact one between other. How do we communicate? So how can I make a domain, an aggregate communicate with another? I can use domain heavens. Domain heavens are another part of domain-driven design that are simply events when an ag one aggregate send to others. Whenever something happens on an aggregate, that aggregate could send an event, tell the other, OK, someone called, someone changed my state. If someone else is interested in this kind of event, it should subscribe to the event and intercept it to manage it. These are the basics of domain-driven design. These patterns, um, if applied correctly, can you create, makes you able to create an application well designed and well maintained. The, the primary points is the bounded context, so it means separated your application in different areas, and the aggregate route that are the base of consistency inside your application. I have a demo at the end of my speech, so you can see some Ruby code on this. But first, I want to do uh, a step further. We can do more. This is the classical uh, layered architecture, lasagna structure. Okay, we have a UI. You have we have the application layer with the domain models and so on. Data, the data layer with the database. If you are a Ruby developer, maybe you are written some Rails application. The UI are the views. The green part is the, are the, um, the controller with the models. And on the, on, the, on the hand side, we have uh, the ORM, that is active record, probably, with the database. Okay. This is a classical architecture. The problem with this is that this kind of layering doesn't make different from reading to writing data. If I read data or, re or write data, the path is the same. I have to pass all the layers of the architecture. And are we sure that reading data from our application and writing data to the application is the same thing? Let's think about it. When you read something, you just query the database, extract the data, and put the data on the view. It's a very simple operation. But when you write something, you do an operation on the data, that operation should be validated. There are business logic behind this operation, and lots of stuff happens before the data is written on the database. So there are, there are differences between reading and writing. So why should we use the same architecture for reading and writing? Another thing that we, we as a developer, should stop thinking is, should stop saying is to think in crude. We always think in saving data database and reading data database. But the customer doesn't think in crude. When the customer creates a contract or send an invoice or do an operation on his application, he doesn't think that when he, when he creates a contract, a contract is saved in the, in the database. He doesn't care about this. He cares about the fact that when he creates a contract, a new contract is created and a new process, a new workflow should start. Okay. So, if we stop thinking that clicking, click on the button to create a contract makes the contract save to the database, and we, can, we start to divide the reading or writing, we can arrive to a new kind of architecture that is called CQRS. It stands for Common Query segregation, Responsibility Segregation. That means doing a command, mean writing something in the database, is different from query from the database. So, for, from the first layer architect, layers architecture, we can arrive to something like this. It is a little bit different. On the left side, we have the right part. Okay? Whenever something happens in the UI, or some operation is needed, that operation files a command on the, on the business layer, the, red, the green block. That command is managed by an handler. The handler operates on the domain model 
and saved and persist data on the database. Okay. But the core of this thing are the commands. Whenever, what, whatever the customer do, clicking buttons uh, on, on, you, on the, uh, your UI, is do, some, do something on your domain model. Don't care about writing now, writing to the database. Reading is much more simpler. We just have to query the database and put the data on the, on the view. We don't have to do anything. So we don't need all the layers that are that slow down the, the development and slow down the performance of our application. OK. From this, we can do a, a little step more. We can divide the database. So we can split the database in two parts and have one write a database just for writing data and one just for reading data. OK. So our application is completed divide it into the write part, write on the write database. The read part, read on the read database. We have two different databases. The advantage of this is that here, the storing uh, structure is quite simpler. It's very simpler. And it's tweeted for the domain model, not for reading. This, uh, this uh, on this side, the, the read database is uh, suited just for reading. So we have views written just for presenting data on the view on the views of the user interface. Usually, here we define one table per view. Every views on the views like herb file or a HAML file have a correspondent table inside the. Uh, database. So whenever I want to show something on the UI, it's just a select star from table, okay, with filters and anyway. The important thing is that we need some denormalization tool, some denormalization class that takes the data written here and they distribute the, um, the data on the read database. This database is not normalized, okay. Data here is very um, is duplicated a lot on, on a lot of table. It's parts on a lot of table. This kind of architecture drive us to another pattern that is becoming quite popular in the Java world and the C# -sharp world, especially. That is event sourcing. From this, if we start thinking not in sense of state, but in sense of transitions, we can change, our, we can shift our point of view on our application. We always think in state because when we create an object in a Redis application, we store the state of the object in the database. So in the database, we always have the last state of our objects. Okay. And active record, um, load the data and create the object for us. But we can think in, in terms of transition instead of state. So for example, in a, in a commerce application, every operation that the customer does on the UI is an event. And each event creates a transition on the state of the application. So for example, the customer, the user, add an item to the, to the, um, the basket, the item, add another item to the basket, delete one item from the basket, apply a coupon to get a discount on his basket, set the shipping address, and complete the order. These are events. And if we, even if we store the events, even of the state, we can rebuild the state just re-executing re the events. OK, so we can, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, I don't have a pointer. Um, every operation that the that user did is a new event in the database. So if we want to know the state of the object here, of our order object here, we just have to load all the events, re-execute them, and we obtain the status of the object at this time. But we can't go back in time. 
because if we execute only the, three, the first three heavens, we can rebuild the state of the object at the third level of, the, of this queue of events. Okay. It's quite a strange way of thinking, but it opens, um, opens the way for other way of thinking. Event sourcing, so it's about storing the deltas of the, of the object from the state transition and not the state. So in the database, we don't have the actual state of the object, but we have all the transition that happens, all the events that happens on one object. That means that the storing, um, the storing structure, it's very simpler. It's just a long queue of events, okay, with, with some parameters maybe, okay, but just only a long queue, one table, for example. And every time we need a state in some moment, you just load the events for that object, re-execute all the events, and we obtain the actual state. Sure, we sometimes need to do some snapshot. So you have to, we have to save the state at some moment in time because if you use the application for years, the events become quite, number, quite bigger and it could be very um, performance, uh, rebuild the, the state of the, the object running heaven from the, the first time, the first moment in time to, to now. This also, this architecture solves also the epic customer problems. Request, sorry. The epic customer request that is, I want it for yesterday. Because in this, with this kind of architecture, you can add a new feature today. You, you can re-execute all the events from the first moment in time till today. And that feature is available in, also on the data of yesterday and the yesterday and the last week and so on. You, so you can update your application in the past. So you can do what is the time travel. So why Ruby? What meaning of Ruby on this? Well, like I said before, I try to port um, a part of an application written in C Sharp in Ruby. Why Ruby? Ruby is fully object-oriented programming languages. It's very expressive. It has metaprogramming that is the different key that static languages doesn't have. With metagramming, you can do lots of things that you can't do with Java or with, or with C Sharp. You can build domain-specific domain languages. It is very useful for, um, for create a language that satisfies the business of the customer. You have tons of gems that help you in developing application at a great community. I just show, I have five minutes maybe, I just show some lines of code to, uh, to show you how this kind of architecture could be in, uh, in Ruby. Uh, okay, for example, I create here, a, it's not uh, an Arrays application or it doesn't use any infrastructure, it's just Ruby code, okay? Can you read over there? Okay, suppose that I'm inside the controller the user click the button to add an item to the basket. Okay, from the, the, mm, the diagram that we saw before here, every comment in the UI create, uh, create a comment inside our code. So our, our controller should just call a method execute command. The command is add, add, uh, add to basket command, okay? It takes some parameters, maybe the basket the ID and the, and the item ID. Okay. This is just what, this is the code that should be inside the controller. Just an execute command. This execute command, where it comes from? It comes from the command executor. Uh, okay. But it's a class, the module, sorry, that uh, given the name of the command, find a, an handler. So for every command that you create, you will have an handler that take uh, this, this command and do the things that need, is needed. Here, in C Sharp, to do, to do this, this small code, you have to write lots of lines because you don't have metaprogramming. Here, I use the convention that the handler has the same name as the command. So I take the command class name 
Okay? I split and remove the common part, and I add the new, and I use this factory to get the class of the handler, the name of the class. So the name of the handler in this case should be add to basket handler. And I should have uh, uh, add to basket handler. Here it is. So the command is just a sort of DTO. Doesn't have logic inside the command. It's just a structure with data inside. The code is, in, is actually in the handler. So the handler of the add to basket command is the is add to basket handler for convention. What it does in the execute method is simply load the data from the database using a repository. A repository is a data is a pattern to manage data from the database to and from the database. Okay. So he load the basket, he load the article that needs to be added to the basket, and call the method basket dot add item. Here the basket is the aggregate root, okay? The basket object. And it has methods inside them, add, add item, which takes the article that I want to add, and a commit method that, okay, says, okay, I did, the, I did all the operation that I need on the basket, do whatever you want, commit the operation, okay? Let's see how the repository is done. Um, basket repository, okay, I, I cheat here. In sense, in this, if we uh, are in the event sourcing uh, architecture, you know that the state of the of your object are persisted is persisted inside uh, a queue of events. So I emulated the queue here is an array. This is the events of some of the uh, aggregate ID one. So I mean the basket one with all the events happens on this, uh, on this basket. So I once added an item, I added another one, I removed another one, I added another one. These are the streams of events. The repository simply loads uh, the, the events from the database, given the ID of the basket, and apply all the events to the basket aggregate. Okay? I know the what all that all what all what happened on this basket i apply this heaven on the basket aggregate and return the basket itself so it's not load the data from the database the state is not in the database um, as is but i have to re-execute all the heavens on the aggregate let's see how the basket aggregate is okay here is the basket it uses a module that is aggregate root helper and it has methods inside. Let's see. The first one was add item that we call in the our we call in our uh, handler. So in the handler we load the customer from the database, re-executing all the events, and call the method add item. Whenever I call a method on a, an aggregate root, uh, it is here. Sorry. What should I have to do is simply raise an event to tell someone that. The caller is telling me to add an item to the basket. So I call raise event, the name of the heaven, item added, and the item itself. So I don't change the state in this case, okay, because I'm inside the transaction, a sort of transaction in memory, but it's a transaction. So I do, I add all the new events that I want to add, and when the handler calls commit, I apply the heavens. So on the commit method that is, that is not in the basket aggregate, but is in the, is in the module. So aggregate uh, root helper. In the commit event, we simply uh, extract all the events that are applied now in the uh, uncommitted events list, that is a list that is managed inside the aggregated root, and we call the method send event on event. The send event uses some metaprogramming just to call method inside the aggregate root. So it means inside the basket. So inside the basket class, we have on item added, that is the private method that the aggregate root calls on the commit event, on the commit calls. 
It is simply called get item and, and increase the quantity of the item. This is the real code that changed the state of the current object. Okay? And this is done using, uh, using metaprogramming like this. The uncommitted event uh, collection is, uh, is defined over there. Okay, just uh, uh, an empty array at the beginning. And whenever you, you call raise event from inside, from inside the aggregate root, like I said before, raise event, item added, and so on, you simply call, store the, inside the uncommitted, uh, uncommitted events the events that is applied, that should be applied to the, to the, um, to the aggregate root. The other methods are just helper methods and doesn't have any other meaning. There are apply discount, item remove it, and so on. But the, the, the important part is that every operation is always split in two parts. The first one, that is the call to add item, is just a raise event. So I, I store the fact that someone calls add item on me. The commit part is where I apply the events that the user asked me to do. Okay. It's quite simpler here. And all the code is on GitHub, so you can get to walk through the code. And the point is that migrating from a C-sharp application to this, uh, we remove lots, lots, lots of code, okay? Because uh, metaprogramming and the uh, Ruby simplicity helps us a lot in maintaining the infrastructure code that is, for example, the aggregate root helper and the repository is very, 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 very simple to use. Just one, two, two slides more to, uh, I want to show you some references. Okay, the two books that explain all what, what, all what I just said is Domain Driven Design by Harry Evans. Is, this is the uh, main book, the blue book. It's quite difficult to read because it's written in a strange way. It is from, it's, it was published in 2004, so it's not quite new. And last year, there was a new book published that is implementing the main driven design that make him made uh, a real world example on applying this content in Java world. So it's written, all the samples are in Java, but it's quite easy to understand and, and to read. Here you can find the code of the simple application. I'm here for three days, so if you want to talk, if you want to try to implement something or navigate through the code with me, I'm, I'm happy to, to do it. That's all. Thank you very much. If you have any question, if you have time, I'm here. We're a bit... <laughs> it, was, it was a run because I didn't know that I have only 30 minutes. I, I, I think about 40 or 45 minutes, so I have to run a little bit to, to be in time. Sorry for this, and no, thank you very much for the talk. We'll take one or two questions here. Actually, I don't have two questions. Uh, do you think it's, I mean, you had over there an idea was to have a read database. Do you think that you actually need a read database or you should actually have view models? That's question one. And question two, do you actually think that uh, is, can you, I mean, can you maintain at a reasonable cost all that metaprogramming? Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's not hard as it seems, I say. We, um, I go back to this, okay. It's not hard that it seems because uh, for this database, you just have to, we use MongoDB, for example, for this database, it's just, it, we just have one collection that store all the events that the, uh, the user apply. So it's quite easy. On, uh, on, on, on MongoDB, you can, you have a sort of triggers. It's not real trigger, but you can intercept when something is written in the database, and we attach a C sharp application. In this case, I don't have a record of that. A C sharp that simply intercepts these events on the database and uh, and delete and route this event to the interested classes. Here there are lots of classes that are the normalizer. Every normalizer is subscribed to a certain event. It takes the event and split the event on the tables that needs to this information. It's not so difficult. No, we use here. We use we still use uh, SQL because it's simple to query data. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Mm, you, maybe you, you need some tool. Okay, we have, we also have some tools around this architecture, but use internally to re-execute the events, to, uh, to check the consistency of the database, and we have the ability to recreate the database on demand. So if something goes wrong, we can rerun all the application, re-executing all the events, and we the database was, was clean. Uh, yes, uh, like I said before, this is just an experiment. It's not a production code yet. An experiment that I made to investigate the, the possibility in, of Ruby in this kind of architecture. Um, you, you should have tests to guarantee the consistency of your code and the metaprogramming code. So, we no, we, it's not enough test to test that. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Yes, that's maybe one of the problem, especially for newcomers, for newcomers developer. But yeah. Another quick question, maybe while we set up Julian. Julian, are you in the room so that we can set you up? No question. Thank you very much, Great. Emmanuel. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>